this has to do with when I first met you. Right. We met at the Kurt meetings in this terrible windowless conference room in a, in a basement. In a basement <laughs> next to near the Houston airport someplace. Right. You were there as as you you fond of saying at the creation when I drew the effort curve that became known as the McLamey curve. And just yes. Can you paint that picture? There there were moments when in a creative process where there is um, kind of like a certain feeling of lightness that there are no bound right there are no boundaries there's a feeling of lightness that everything is possible and i felt at that moment that everything was possible when we were in that awful basement <laughs> that somehow we could use technology use computer technology building information modeling to fundamentally change the profession and change architecture, engineering, and construction. It was, it was a really inspiring moment. My name is Mark Arlapage, and I'm joined by Patrick McLaney, FAIA, and former CEO of the international architecture firm, HOK. This is Build Smart. Patrick shares stories from his remarkable 50-year career at HOK, rising from junior designer to CEO of the company. With themes of leadership, finance, people, culture, and so much more, you'll find that there's a lesson in every episode. Welcome back to Build Smart. In our last episode, Patrick got to work as the new CEO of HOK, turning his strategy for navigating through three simultaneous crises into reality. His first step was to rejuvenate upper management. If you haven't listened to that episode, I encourage you to go back and listen to all the episodes in order to hear Patrick's full story and insights into how to design a world-class architecture firm. In today's episode, Patrick explains the origin of and the philosophy behind the effort curve, later known as the McLamey curve, which grew to have significant impact on HOK and the profession at large. Later known as the creator of the McLamey curve. Can you tell listeners how the McLamey curve came into being? It's actually a kind of a funny story. First of all, I would never, never name a curve for myself. I did not <laughs> do that. <laughs> I, I did create something that I called the effort curve, but Here's how it started. A couple of years after I became CEO of HOK, I got a call from somebody that worked for GSA, the federal government entity that's charged with taking care of all the real estate, including hiring architects to design buildings. So GSA is an important client. The GSA had joined a group called CURT, Construction Users Roundtable. And CURT was made up of big users of design and construction services, big pharmaceutical companies, oil companies, just big. So the person at GSA said, we're meeting in Houston. We want you to come and explain to us why we should use architects. <laughs> it wasn't an invitation. It was a summons. Yeah. So I said, well, okay, yes, ma'am, and I'll do it. So I got on a plane, went to Houston. The meeting was in a dreary basement conference room of a hotel that was next to the Houston airport. Not a, not a grand place for a meeting, but it, good things happened there. When I arrived, uh, I met a number of people I already knew and a few that I had heard about. Phil Bernstein from Autodesk was there. So they had invited software companies that served the AE industry. And there were structural engineers, there were a few people that were consultants and so on. A group of maybe 15 or 20 of us and the Kurt committee were people that basically were used to hiring architects and engineers to design buildings or entire facilities. And um, they basically started the meeting by saying, we don't know what's wrong with you architects. <laughs> there was a representative there from Shell Oil Company and he enrolled a great big drawing, or it was actually an aerial photograph of a new refinery. He said, see this? 
This refinery contains literally thousands of pipes and elbows and valves and pressure vessels and sensors and so on. And he said, see over here in the corner, and he pointed to one little corner of the property and there was a little building there. He said, see that? Yes, that's an office building. We had more change orders on this little office building than we did the entire refinery. <laughs> What's wrong with you people? And if you can't get that part right, we're going to find some other way to get it done without using an architect. That was the implied threat. So that was our mission. Is that we were to devise a new way of working uh, that would somehow avoid all this problem. The truth of it was, I think all of us had heard this before. Why is it that you know, we joined this noble profession of architecture to create buildings and spaces for people. And we end up getting down in the weeds with contractors and owners about this doesn't fit and that doesn't work and you left this out and so on. Why did we do this? And more important, what can we do about it? I had been thinking about this problem myself. I was at mid-career. This is after 25 years in, in HOK. So I'd been around the barn a few times with projects. It seemed to me that by the time I reached that 25th year, the profession and the practice had begun to change dramatically. First, we had begun to transition from using drawing by hand to using the computer. And the computer, in fact, was three-dimensional computing, 3D CAD, it was called in those days, before the days of BIM. 3D CAD was becoming known. The other thing is that the traditional way of procuring work was changing. Uh, when I started as a young architect in the 70s, the 60s actually, all the work was designed, bid, built. The owner hires an architect to design, and then after the architect is finished with the work, hires uh, usually a low bid contractor to do the work. So the architect and the contractor don't know who each other is until the architect work, work is 80% finished. And the AIA standard form of contract that was in vogue showed that the maximum effort that we expend as designers and architects isn't when we're designing, it's in when we're doing working drawings or production documents. Well, I began to wonder about, wasn't there some other way that we should be doing our work that would be less error prone and more trouble free? Beginning of the second day, people were picking around at the problem. So I said, well, I've got an idea about what's wrong and what we should do. And went up to, it wasn't a whiteboard, it was a butcher paper tablet. And I drew first what I called the, the traditional effort curve that a design, design team expends on the project. And the effort is slow and small at the beginning with the design team, maybe just one designer or a small team. And as the design grows from schematic design and design development, the team maybe grows a little bit. And then after design development comes production or construction documentation, and the team gets to a peak. And a lot of people join the team. And then just before bidding, if the project has been successfully documented, the team gets very small. And there's a small team from bidding through construction. And I drew that on the board and I said, this is AIA B141 form of contract was built for hand drawing of buildings. And this is what it looks like. The snake that swallowed the elephant. There's a big bulge at working drawings. And that's where most of our effort is. And I said, what's wrong with this? So I drew another curve starting in the upper left corner. And I said, here's the potential to change the design. Changing design is easy at the beginning. You can, you can decide in a heartbeat to make the building smaller or larger if you had inputs as to whether you were too big or too small. But as you document more, the ability to change the design dramatically drops. So that's a curve that starts almost as a vertical line that ends up flatlining somewhere in working drawings. And the other curve, I started from the bottom left, said the cost of change is a real killer for us. It starts out that to change your drawings or your computer drawings at the beginning, simple. A couple of mouse clicks, a couple of keyboard strokes, and you can change. 
as you document more, again, in the traditional way of thinking and working, the more expensive it is to change it because it means even if you're not erasing sheets of drawings, even if you're changing a computer model, it still takes effort. It takes more work to change things if you get it wrong the first time. And the further down the, the road you are toward documentation, the harder it is. And then finally, if you get to the end of working drawings and you have an estimate that says your building's over budget, your options are few and far between. What do you do? Well, most architects do a terrible thing. They strip the finishes. They degrade the finishes. Instead of the trousseau floor, you have linoleum or something. And instead of having the right quality of windows and doors, maybe you down downgrade those to a lower quality. So you cheapen the building, especially the parts of the building that the owner can see and touch, doing no great service to the profession of architecture. So that's the last thing you want to do. But that too often has been the way that architects have managed to bring a building in on, on budget. If you have to change something during construction, that cost of change gets to be the greatest of all. Why? Because it's already been bid and priced into the budget. You're going to pay more for that contractor to change something out. And you're going to pay especially more if they have to remove something that's already put into place and replace it with something else. So, you know, for something as noble as architecture, to go through a process like that is like a built-in assurance that the profession will be in a weakened state for the most part, unless we can change that. So I said, you know, there are two things that we can do that are already here that can change that. One is that we have the computer now. And the computer is really, really good at the things that people are not good at. It can add and subtract and remember stuff with incredible memory. And uh, the other thing that's wonderful about the computer is we've had this growth of apps that can tell you as you're making keystrokes and roughing out a building, whether you're on budget, whether you're on program, whether you're complying with the client's brief, whether you're reaching your energy consumption goals or your green goals and a thousand other things. And the computer can keep track of all of that for you so that you get more feedback early, 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 early in the process than ever before possible. That's one big thing. The other big thing is that, you know, when we looked at that Shell Oil refinery, the refinery with all the valves and pipes and elbows, guess what that was? That was a design build. That means the designer and the builder, the contractor, worked together from the beginning of design until the end of construction. So the designer of the refinery had instant feedback from the builder of the refinery. You better move this because I won't fit there because of that, so on. They had instant feedback for cost. They had instant feedback for constructability, for conflicts, and so on. Architects, I believe, do themselves a disservice and the profession a disservice by design, bid, build. And I think the the lowest bidder is a disservice because it, it basically is a license for contractors who are less than have less than integrity to bid low and make up their profit and claims and make architects look like fools. So I said, standing in front of this group at PERT, I think we ought to move that effort, the major effort forward in time. Instead of putting our maximum effort in working drawings, we can have actually the computer draw most of this up and getting more and more this way, especially with BIM software. And we should put maximum effort possible in the schematics and DD portion of the work to make sure that we've got everything tied down and we should be doing it in cooperation with our new partner, our contractor. That if we did that, we couldn't guarantee it because architects can't guarantee, but I can almost assure you we get the same results as the Shell Oil got for the refinery. Uh, and it would be a change. Well, when I finished the diagram and walked back to my seat, there was silence for a second. And then people started to talk all at once. It was very exciting for people. And they said, oh, I hadn't thought about it that way. You make it very clear that the real problem is we're working at uh, with one hand tied behind our back by not having 
our build partner with us. And we're not taking advantage of the new technology that's available with the computer and the software to help us stay on track from the first moment of design so that the computer is helping us stay on track along with the, the contractor reviews to help us stay on track. So we're penalizing ourselves and making the profession look like uh, a bunch of dummies and having curt people call summon us to say, why should we bother using an architect? By the end of that day, everybody had decided that the CURT committee that we were summoned to would uh, make a report to the full CURT board that used the effort curve as its centerpiece, the effort curve and the design build idea. Well, the AIA had some representation at that meeting and the AIA got very interested in it. So the next summer after the CURT meeting, our committee was invited to make a presentation of our findings at an AIA plenary session. And I got to present the effort curve as my part of the presentation. People took notice and the AIA got quite excited about it and eventually uh, developed a new committee that I was on for a period of time that developed a new strategy for working with a contractor and an owner in a partnership form that in fact shifted the effort forward in time. So I'm very proud of it, but it didn't sort of the McLamey curve. When you went to that meeting, to the Kurt meeting, and uh, you saw that, that aerial photograph, yep. and you were asked that question, and your answer was this curve, um, was this something that had been brewing inside of you for a long time, and this was an opportunity to express it? Where did the idea for the effort curve come from? The idea was brewing inside of me, but it actually happened way, way early in my life. My grandfather was a carpenter. And I, in fact, I became interested in architecture because of my grandfather. He built houses on spec, and sold them. That's how he made a living. And he drew up house plans at his kitchen table with a homemade drafting board, homemade T-square, but a store-bought triangle. And uh, I always wanted to draw house plans. I said, Grandpa, can I kind of come draw the house plans. Finally, one day he let me draw them at the kitchen table. And I drew a house plan. I thought it was beautiful. He took a glance at it and he said, but where's the bathroom? Well, I'd left out the bathroom. <laughs> he also taught me the rudiments of carpentry. He wouldn't let me use the power tools properly. So, but he taught me how to use a saw and a hammer and a tape measure. And he gave me a great lesson. He said, you always measure twice and cut once. That's an old carpenter's saying. And I said, well, why, Grandpa? Why, why is that important? He said, well, because if you measure wrong and you cut your wood too short, you wasted the wood. You have to use another piece of wood that costs money. And you also have to go back to the store and buy more wood. And that takes money and time. So measure twice and only cut once. And that stuck with me, the idea that you take your time to get things right at the beginning is, an old, is as old as time. And what we architects have gotten lulled into with design bid build and with this major effort during construction documents, which was a leftover from the, the era of hand drafting, that the world had moved on and we needed to move on too. Mark, the best things that are built today are built in factories, I think. I'm sure. And uh, they're built as a collaboration between design and build. Um, you don't see Apple iPhones, the arguments between the designer and the manufacturer. It's all one team. And the same thing with airplanes. Can you imagine hiring an architect to design an airplane and then going to a low bid factory to have it built? Would you fly in it? No. I would not. No, sir. So Kurt adopted the effort curve in the final report and then shared it with the AIA at the AIA convention in 2005, as you mentioned. What did they do with that report? Well, the AIA, it really resonated. Uh, it was one of those things that finally there were enough people that saw this and said, oh, this really makes a lot of sense instead of just one more report to go on a shelf somewhere. And so the AIA at that convention started a new study group that eventually led to uh, a whole committee. I was on the committee for a while. It was called the AIA 
uh, Integrated Project Delivery Strategy, or IPD, and they, the AIA created a new form of agreement between the owner, architect, and contractor, a tripartite agreement, where the three entities that go into making a building, owner, architect, and contractor, instead of two contracts and three parties, would have one contract and three parties would sign the contract and they would agree to share the risk and the reward. And it was an inducement to collaborate, to help each other solve problems early so they didn't get out of hand. And I'm, I'm very proud of that. And I think that that movement, uh, IPD, whatever you wish to call it, the idea that a partnership between the parties that design and the parties that build actually is an old idea also. It goes way back to the building guilds where uh, the great cathedrals of Europe, for example, in the Middle Ages were not designed by architects and built by contractors. They were designed by guild masters, people that knew all about how to work with stone or wood or glass and built by the guilds. So it was an integrated process then and we gradually lost that and I think we need to get that back in order to really do our best work as architects. It's noble work, but we're not alone. We should be in partnership. Did you make changes at HOK as well, you know, applying the effort curve there as well? Can you share some examples of what you did at HOK? Yes, I did. Once this became so clear to everybody, including me, I went back to HOK and got to work within the firm to develop our own strategy for uh, using the same strategy, this effort curve, a design build strategy with heavy use of the computer and computer testing tools used at the beginning of construction. And uh, HOK has continued to develop that process. There are specialized people within the firm uh, that work on multiple projects that have this special knowledge. Uh, but it's it's become quite widespread throughout the firm. There is a, I think, a seminal project that exemplifies this, uh, the KAUST project. In Saudi Arabia, King Abdulaziz, who's now passed away, King Abdulaziz was getting on in years and wanted, like so many kings, he wanted something that was a legacy and decided to fund a new university for science and technology. He wanted the kingdom of Saudi Arabia to join the modern world. And he wanted that university to help pull the backwardness of the kingdom to the current day. And it was an enlightened idea. So he went to the Ministry of Education and asked them how long it would take to design and build a new campus, a new university on a piece of land someplace in the kingdom. And they said eight to 10 years. And he said, I don't have eight to 10 years to live. I need to move faster than that. So again, with his advisors, he decided to go to the one entity in Saudi Arabia that knew how to move quickly and it was well-organized, Aramco. Aramco is the Saudi Arabian oil company. And uh, Aramco knew how to get things done. They knew how to drill holes in the ground and get oil out and refine the oil and ship it and produce most of the income for the kingdom. So he asked Aramco, if you did this and pulled out all the stops, how fast could you design and build this? And they said, 36 months from the <laughs> beginning of design till the end of construction. So it went from 10 years to 36 months. That's right. And this was no slouch of a campus. This is five and a half million square feet, a campus for 20,000 to start, plus a town to support the campus because this would be built in the desert. Everything from complete scratch. And so uh, Aramco had a US office in Houston and the Houston office was given the task of putting out an RFP to interested firms for the design work. And that was worded such that it wasn't clear what was being designed, but HOK Houston put in a pitch for it and uh, got a phone call and the one of the Aramco guys from Houston said, hi, this is Aramco. We've decided to select you. And the HOK Houston people thought it was to do a master plan for a new university, which HOK has done lots of. 
we've selected you for the new campus project. Can you be in London by next Monday? This is a Friday. Well, sure, you don't turn that down. They went to London. Tom Robson was among them. Tom was the man who became my COO. And uh, Tom, when they got to the meeting, there were Aramco people there. There was a contractor there. There were people from the, the ministry. And he said, well, what's the goal here? He said, we want to design and build this campus for 20,000 people, five and a half million square feet in 36 months. And Tom thought he didn't hear him right. He said, you mean design it in 36 months? No, from the beginning of design until they move in, 36 months. <laughs> so what that meant was you take the effort curve and you compress it so that the all the effort is at the very, very, very beginning. That's what the Calst project turned into. By the following week, we had a project team in Houston and in London. Eventually, we had 10 offices involved, over 100 people in the firm. Fortunately for us, working across, by then, a harmonious network so everybody could collaborate. So they hired you. You thought you were going in for master plan. They hired you for the entire project to design every building in the campus. And it was a horse race from beginning to end. When they met with us in London, the contractor was already out at the site, drilling a hole in the ground for a well to get water and beginning preliminary grading, even though they didn't know what would be built. It was a site on the west coast of Saudi Arabia on the Red Sea, north of Jeddah, which is a major seaport. Nothing else there, nothing, just sand. Fortunately, we developed a strategy that could keep up with the pace of construction. I mean, literally, as soon as we had the shape of the buildings, they were drilling holes in the ground, putting piers in. And uh, we were still designing the walls, the exterior walls, when the, the frame was going up. Complete, full design and build at the same time. So there were deadlines for us to meet, developed by the contractor, deadlines when we had to deliver some project progress documents to the contractor to allow them to continue. And I'm very proud of the fact that it didn't take us 36 months, it took us 32 months huh. from the beginning of design until old King Abdulaziz himself came out to the campus to uh, help dedicate it. And it's standing there today. And Mark, the building had a very, very low, even with the pace of construction, very, very low incidence of claims or tear out work. And it achieved a lead platinum rating at the time, it was more square footage that got a lead platinum rating than all of the lead platinum projects in history up to that point, that one project. Uh, and this was conventional construction to a high level of quality. It's an amazing project and it shows the power of great design harnessed to an aggressive construction progress, it shows you what we can do if we apply ourselves properly and work in partnership and we leverage the heck out of the computer to keep track of things. With the lessons learned on that project, did you take those lessons learned and apply them to other projects in HOK? How does HOK deliver projects today? Yes, uh, we deliver things. Not every project is, is pushing us like Kaust, but uh, I would say that the trend at HOK, and we, we enjoy this, we welcome this, is to have a contractor as collaborator. I will say, Mark, that not every contractor is someone we wish to collaborate with. We'd like to have some choice. There are contractors that we know that we like to work with and others that maybe we don't know that would be taking a chance and others that we know and would not like to work with. So we wanna work just like anybody with people that we know and trust. But it does work, and, and it's amazing what we can accomplish if we set our goals right and if we work together. I think the real lesson of the, of the effort curve, the McLemy curve, is 90% collaboration and maybe 10% enabled by technology. How did it become known as the McLemy curve? Well, <laughs> after it appeared in the AIA plenary session, I started to get requests. Can I use the effort curve in my slideshow. Well, sure, go ahead. And the effort curve started to be shown at all kinds of 
AIA and other events by people that were talking about improving the process for design and construction. And with attribution to McLamy, it, it gradually became known as the McLamy curve, which is a point of some embarrassment to me <laughs> because uh, I think it would be unseemly for me to name something after myself. Uh, I did have a son. I named him after myself, Patrick. <laughs> but the effort curve is to me still the effort curve. But I've kind of given up. It's, it's now known as the McLamy curve. And it's kind of fun. So what are the lessons we need to learn in this episode, Patrick? Well, that as architects, in order to give ourselves the right chance to do a good job, we need to shift our efforts earlier in time to solve problems early before it's too late, before it gets too expensive. And we need to coordinate early with engineers for best results later. So I know too many architects that say, I don't want the engineers involved until I'm in uh, DD our working drawings. I think that's completely wrong. And coordinate early with the contractor, I think is essential. If you really want to do the right job, find a contractor, not as your opponent for the project, but as your partner, someone you trust that you like to work with. And you will find you'll do a better job with your building because it will be better constructed and you and the contractor will work out solutions that neither of you could have done on your own. And then finally, Thanks to my grandfather, measure twice, cut once. To continue the story, come back next week for the next episode of Build Smart. Patrick sets his sights on reclaiming the company culture HOK once had. Listen in next week to find out how HOK did it and how you can do it too. Offices that were not doing well or that were not led well were unnaturally quiet. Good offices that are well run, are filled with energy and people are not afraid to speak out. Offices that are poorly led uh, or that are suffering, that, that don't have enough work and so on, are unnaturally quiet. I think it's, it's a number of factors, but it did tell me that we had leadership issues in an office where it was unnaturally quiet and they went on the list as leaders to be re reviewed by the XCOM and decisions had to be made. Thank you for listening. To read along and see illustrations and personal photos that accompany this series, get Patrick's book, Designing a World-Class Architecture Firm. I encourage you to go grab a copy today and follow along as we continue the story. It's available now at gablemedia.com slash buildsmartbook. This podcast is a Gable Media production and is produced by Demetrius Lynch Jr. Gable Media is the home of curated thought leadership for an audience dedicated to building a better world. You can listen in, subscribe, and find more content like this from our network partners at gablemedia.com. That's G-A-B-L media.com.